Amen. Well, good morning, Christ Fellowship. God is good and all the time. It is a joy as always to be with you this morning and all of you watching at home or wherever you may be today traveling for spring break. We welcome you to Christ Fellowship. I'm Pastor Reuben Sines and it is a joy to be with you. Well, today we continue our Lenten journey on this second Sunday of Lent. And for those of you that were not here last week, we began a new series titled A Jesus-Shaped Life. And the hope for us is that over this 40-day journey, as we seek to find ourselves at the foot of the cross, ultimately celebrating the resurrection on Easter morning, that all of us will make a commitment within ourselves and before this congregation and before God to do our very best to live a life that best examples and reflects the life of Jesus Christ Himself. And so today we're talking about obedience, obedience. Last week you mentioned that in the ways that we are called to live as Jesus lived, we must first begin by thinking like Jesus with humility. The second being that we must love others like Jesus. The third being is that we should seek to know God, our Father, like Jesus. And fourthly, we must be obedient like Jesus. What do we think about when we think about obedience for me personally growing up as a child obedience was about following my parents rules right obedience for many of us in our minds and our hearts seems to be a lot about rules and in the church when we talk about obedience especially for someone who say is new to the faith it can actually be something that is more discouraging than encouraging. This is why I do not select or choose faith because why do I want to be part of an institution that is only about rules, policy, structure? But what about me? What about me? See, I want a church that makes me feel free. Obedience does not sound free. Obedience has limits. Obedience has reservation. Obedience means that I have to be willing to put aside my own desire and spirit in order to fall under something or someone whom I do not see. Or whom I have questions about. And again, follow rules that I may not necessarily agree with. Especially rules that we may feel were created by church and not by God. See, in Jesus' day, For a very long time, the people's example of obedience came from the likes of people like the Pharisees. That was the image of obedience. Because the Pharisees, for their entire life, the high priests of the temple, sought to live and to obey and stay within the bounds of the 613 or so commandments from the Old Testament law. And if you deviated from any of these written laws... We were disowning God. And we were breaking the laws and the commandments. And so for someone who was a follower who did not have the same type of access to the temple or to be in the presence of God because they maybe did not feel that they were worthy nor that they were capable of following those rules and so they just watched from a distance. And it alienated and it pushed people out because again, it was all about rules and rules that just did not seem seem obtainable. That's not for me. That's for them. But even as these Pharisees were super pious and they were super devoted to maintaining and keeping these laws, when Jesus came into the picture, He wasn't impressed. He wasn't impressed at all. You see, and the people, the people question that also then what is it that you want for us, Jesus? Because if that is what obedience is, and now you're here telling me, That that's not what obedience is truly about. 
So Jesus is not urging the people to keep more laws or to keep more rules or to be even like the Pharisees who are rule followers. See, rules are not God's aim for His children. Transformation is God's intent for His children. Transformation is His intent for His children. And transformation starts here in the depths of our heart. Obedience in the Bible essentially is defined in three different ways. It's defined through how we hear and listen to God. It's defined in the way in which we trust and have faith in God. And it is defined also in the way that we completely surrender ourselves before God. Did I mention any rules in there? No. And all of these matters of hearing, listening, trusting faith, surrender, starts here. Through the will and the willingness of the heart to be transformed and changed. I want to look at a text today. In James chapter 1. And it's a challenging text. And even the book of James is a challenging one. One day we'll do a sermon series on the book of James. And talk a little bit about authentic Christianity. And also some of the things that we find in the book of James that are challenging to us today. But James essentially in this text is talking about obedience at its root as Christians, as followers of Christ, how we are to live and how we are to do what we're not supposed to do so we can then live full and whole lives before Christ. This is what it says, verse 19. We're going to kind of go through this. Know this, my dear brothers and sisters, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to grow angry. This is because an angry person doesn't produce God's righteousness. Did we hear that today, church? Here we go. Everyone should be quick to listen. I want you to have this image in your head. When we run to God, it should be to run to God instead of yelling at Him. He is calling us to come before Him and say, what do you have for me? Is that how, that's how we do it, right? When we come before God in prayer. That's how we do it, right? When we, when we approach God, when we gather as a community in faith and church, and we come expecting, we come forward saying, Lord, what is it that you have? Here I am, Lord. Or do we come before God with our fists up high? Ready to speak. You see, us as a human race, as creation, we are reactionary. (laughs) We love to react. We want the little pieces of drama and everything that's happening in the world so we can say something about it. And so we can feel affirmed and confirmed in what we believe. And we don't take into consideration what God says or what others may say or how they may be impacted by our reaction. And see, I think this is the believer's weakness. It's sometimes our inability to listen. Because the non-believers, when they see a Christian react before listening, it only affirms their skepticism of faith in the first place. And without us realizing it and knowing it, not even considering who's watching or who's hearing who or who needs to hear, we could be the very element and tool that actually helps move them further and further away. Oftentimes we come before God ready to speak before we listen. James urges us 
Be quick to listen first, slow to speak, and slow to grow angry. See, oftentimes it's opposite. We're angry, we're fast to speak, and then listening is not even an option. We live in a world right now where it's you're rather on one side or the other, and no one is willing to listen to each other. Or rather, we're willing to throw fiery darts across the way, back and forth like a volley, as if that's going to solve anything. And so what do we do? We just start building higher walls, thicker, keep us separated. Maybe that's just what's best. We'll just stay away from each other. We can't even be in the same rooms with each other. And then you look at a text like James, and it's like, you know, and this is the things that they were dealing with also. And then we can ask ourselves, is this what God intended for us? Is this why Christ came? No. So I pray that we as a church, as people, as, as Christians, may be quick to listen. To be able to sit in a room with someone we maybe do not agree with and hear them. And in turn, hear the other. And then when we do speak, we do it from a spirit of love and compassion. With the spirit of Christ. With an obedient spirit not a spirit of our own. Because the only thing that will come of this is the lack of production of God's righteousness. And we talked about this, that God's righteousness in its essence and what righteousness means biblically, it's about doing right towards others. That, that's true righteousness. It's about putting others before you. That, that, that's, that's righteousness. We talked a little about this last week, about humility before God, seeking holiness, and holiness being about first God and others before self. So righteousness begins by in how we put others before us, doing right by others, even those we do not see eye to eye with, even those we do not necessarily, I I struggle to love that person, but doing right is doing right by others, not by self, but by others. We, we, We need to hear that today, church. Because if we do not understand that, then, then what God has intended for His people, for creation to flourish and to grow and to be in this communion with one another and with God above all, He is saying that that cannot happen. There's no place for that. The, the, the soil has been laid. The seeds have been planted. But our anger are like the weeds that keep popping up when the wind comes blowing dust in and seeds from other places and they begin to grow and they begin to pop up everywhere and we'll look at it and we'll say, oh, it's not too bad. But if if you know anything about lawn care, turn your eyes away from that lawn for two days and you come back and there are weeds everywhere. They grow faster than the grass. As a homeowner, I'm learning this and I don't like it. I don't. And then the worst thing about weeds, and sometimes you get angry, you know, you're walking in my truck, oh, there's a weed, let me yank it out, toss it back in the grass, and that's mistake number one, because it's just going to replant itself. And it's going to grow triple, quadruple, over and over again. Or, you know, let me just get the lawnmower. It's gone, I can't see it anymore. Well, guess what? The grass is going to stay pretty low, but that weed is going to come up high. And in our anger, that's all we're going to produce. And it's going to lead to more anger, more anger, and then it's going to begin to cloud our vision for what we're trying to plant and do, and we're going to lose sight of everything. And then we're going to start leading with anger. We're going to be speaking first. We're not going to be willing to listen. Forget YouTube. Forget Pinterest. Whatever. Put it all aside. i got to figure this out myself. And that's not going to fly. That's not going to fly. So then that's why James says, therefore, with humility... With humility, it's not about us. Set aside all moral filth. (laughs) He's a pretty bold guy. And the growth of wickedness. Let's just say, the way you're going to look at weeds, hopefully from this day on, will be forever changed. And the growth of wickedness. We're going to call weeds wickedness now, okay? There's wickedness, there's wickedness, there's wickedness. You better run to grab those gloves and start yanking them out. It says, set aside moral filth and the growth of wickedness and welcome the word planted deep inside of you 
the very word that is able to save you. What is the word planted in us? The gospel. The gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. That has been planted in each and every single one of us. Like I said, the soil. The soil has been laid. It's there. It's there. It's ripe for the planting. It's ripe for the harvest. It's there. It's there in us. If all of us believe that we were created in the image of God and everything that God stands for and everything that God has given, then naturally in our very being, in the depths of our heart, in who we are, it is planted there, even in the non-believer's heart. So don't ever say someone you come across who they are a non-believer, that they are without hope. No, that same seed, that gospel message, that good news has been planted deep inside of them as well, all of us together. It is the very thing that unites us. It is the very thing that once we acknowledge that it's there and we don't look at it and say, oh, it's a lost cause or oh, there's no place for this or oh, it's not deep enough or oh, it's not soft enough. It's too hard. It's too dry. Whatever it is. No, it's there. It's there. The gospel, the name, the life, Jesus Christ is there. Amen, church? Don't ever forget that. So it requires for us to push aside these things sometimes so we may be able to clearly see what has always and already been there. And again, it begins with humility. It begins with humility, which goes all the way back to the top. We have to be willing to listen. Listen. Put ourselves aside. Put ourselves aside. Verse 22, this is then where we start seeing this idea of obedience. Verse 22, you must be doers of the word and not only hearers who must let themselves. So this is the other side of it. So we've heard, now we're called to do. So you must be doers of the word and not only hearers who mislead themselves. So when I was reading this text, how many of you all have seen the show The Office? The Office? Anybody? Yeah, if you haven't, YouTube this scene I'm about to talk about. Michael Scott. It's an epic scene. He's driving to go visit clients, six of their biggest clients that they have lost, to take them goodie baskets. And um, none of them accept his goodie baskets, or they, don't, or they don't give back his business. And so he's driving with one of his associates, and they're listening to the GPS Okay. And, he, and early in the episode, he's talked about how awesome the GPS is. Right? It's this great new thing. It's like one of those old school Garmin ones. And so they come up to a stop sign, and the GPS says, turn right. Now, clearly, if you're watching the show, you can see that there's a right turn about five feet up in front. But Michael takes it as, well, I'm going to turn right, literally right here in this spot. So he takes a quick right. And the associate's like, wait a second, it means... The bare right, the right that's coming up over there. But Michael's like, no, this it means right, right here. Well, drives himself right into a lake. Right? Drives himself right into a lake. You see, Michael heard. He heard. But he was so clouded with his anger and his frustration because he was not able to get his clients back that he did not hear correctly. And he misled himself into believing something that was not true. Or made it out to say, seem as what he had heard in his own mind is what he thought was true. And ultimately, it led him straight into a lake. And God calls us, yes, to live a certain way. And we'll hear it, but again, perhaps because we think it's only about rules or we don't agree with it, we'll try to take our own shortcuts, make our own paths. I hear you, God, and I'm doing it, but instead of going all the way over there, I'm just going to do it here. And we'll cut corners. Well, see, church, there's a name for shortcuts. It's called sin. 
anything that goes away from God because we decide that this is what I, I think this is what I've heard, this is what I feel like I should do, so I'm going to do it anyways. Away from God. Mislead ourselves. And James is trying to tell them that you've got to be doers of the word, not only hearers who mislead themselves. In Luke chapter 6, verses 46 through 49, Jesus has just given this miraculous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, and He, and he finishes it with this, this parable. A perfect example of, of, of two people who have heard, but one who has tried taking the shortcuts, maybe because they're clouded by their lack of patience or frustration, and the other who, who heard, and not only just heard, but actually went and did and trusted and had faith and did, it, and did it right. This is what it says, Jesus. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and then don't do what I say? I'll show you what it's like. When someone comes to me, hears my word, puts them into practice. It's like a person building a house by digging deep and laying the foundation on bedrock. So when the flood came, the rising water smashed against it. Smashed against that house, but the water could not shake the house because it was well built. But those who don't put into practice what they hear were like a person who built a house without a foundation. The flood water smashed against it and collapsed it instantly. And it was completely destroyed. See, the first guy, he heard, he went out, got a mortgage, got a loan, rented an excavator, took the time, did it right, got it inspected, had it built, and he was solid. Maybe he didn't go as fast as he wanted. And if you live in today's world and you're trying to buy a house or build a new house, God knows that those timelines, they're not always truthful. But you're faithful nonetheless because you're hopeful in the dream that you'll have a home for your family and so you remain faithful and you hang in there. So that's one guy. And that's the harder way because it may cost more up front. It may take some sacrifice. But we do it because we have trust and faith in what will be even though we may not see it right away. The second guy is like the guy who decides to go out and find money elsewhere and tries to cut corners and save costs, and says, surely that will not happen to me. Surely where I build now will be fine. Builds the house on the sand without a foundation, and it collapses. And so to go back to verse 46 where Jesus says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, but don't do what I say? Jesus is saying, I told you, <laughs> it's really simple. Have faith, have trust, believe in who I am, believe in what I'm calling you to do. You may not understand it at first, but take every step in faith, trusting that I am before you, that I'm with you, that I love you. It's going to be difficult, sure. It's going to require sacrifice, absolutely. Absolutely. But the end result will be greater than anything you could have imagined. So trust in Him. Have faith in Him. Verse 23. Those who hear but don't do the word are like those who look at their faces in a mirror. They look at themselves, walk away, and immediately forget what they were like. You know, I was thinking about that. Have you ever done that in the morning? You look at yourself in the mirror to make sure, ah, okay, I think it's all right. And then you go about your day, you go to HEB, and you're coming up to the sliding doors, and you just peek over, make sure, okay, I still look okay. And you're going through the aisle, and you get into the frozen section, right before you open the door, you're like, okay, good, all right, awesome, solid, we're still okay. And you close it, and then you go, and then you finally get back home, and you go look in the mirror, and you're like, I went to the store like that? You know what I'm talking about? That have, maybe it just happens to me all the time, I don't know. I could have ran into somebody at the store, right? That's what James is saying happens to us. When we leave these li live these lives away from God and we try to take these steps on our own and we try to create images that are based and rooted on our own desires, our own wants, our own thoughts, 
our own understanding of what we think we heard, what we think we need to look like, how we need to live, or what others are going to think of us. We, we built these narratives for ourselves and these stories and these images, and we'll look at ourselves in the mirror and we'll try to fit those pieces into our minds, into our hearts, into our flesh, and then we'd be looking and say, well, I don't recognize this person, but if this is what the world wants, then so be it. And the only thing that happens is that when we go about living our lives and we keep looking at ourselves in the mirror, we're not seeing who we're supposed to be. And it's a struggle and it's a challenge and we find it difficult for ourselves to come to peace, to come with grips, to answer the call that God has placed in our lives. So we have to be people who are willing to look at ourselves in the mirror and say, I know who I am, not because of me, but because of who God is. And find peace in that. And see, that does not happen for us, church, unless we are willing to surrender everything that we are unless we're willing to surrender everything that we are and put it all before Him. To be willing to open our hearts, be able to say, God, here I am, right? And use me. Use me. Show me. Lead me. Guide me. And if we do this, and this happens, and in verse 25 it continues, but there are those who study the perfect law, the law of freedom, and continue to do it. They don't listen and then forget, but they put it into practice and in their lives. The perfect law, the law of freedom... That's what we learn and gather and have received from Christ. The salvation, the hope of new life. To be transformed, to be changed, to be able to begin to live lives as Christ lived. To put it in practice, to love God, to love others, to think like Jesus, to be obedient. And obedience is so much just about saying, yes. Yes, God. Yes. I am willing I'm here before you to walk and go wherever it is that you call me. For these people, they will be blessed in whatever they do. It continues in verse 26. If those who claim devotion to God and don't control what they say, they mislead themselves. So now he's just reiterating. He's bringing it back around. Therefore, their devotion is worthless. True devotion the kind that is pure and faultless before God the Father, again, using the example of Christ, is this. To care for the orphans and the widows and their difficulties and to keep the world from contaminating itself. So again, he leads us right back to it about others and then maintaining the world as God intended it to be. Obedience. Obedience is not, church, simply about following rules. It's about being transformed. It's about coming before God, listening, offering yourself before Him, putting all your trust and your faith in Him, surrendering yourself, becoming and living as the people, the children that God has created us to be. And we can begin by putting into practice how we treat others, the orphans, the widows, the hurt, the broken, and how we serve God. How we seek to be a people who are set apart. Set apart. Don't give in to the imbalances and when people try to come and push you off your tightrope. No. No. Stay firm. Stand firm. Remember who you are. Remember whose you are. And walk a life that is honoring and pleasing to God above all. Amen, church? I'd like the praise band to come forward. I'm going to close this by reading Psalm 119, verses 1 through 8. And this is what it says for us. And I invite you where you are, just bow your heads, close your eyes and hear these words. Let this be our closing prayer. And listen to this, this declaration, this word of praise, this word of affirmation, this word of faith. This is what it says. Those whose way is blameless, who walk in the Lord's instruction, 
are truly happy. Those who guard God's laws are truly happy. They seek God with all their hearts. Not some of it. All of it. And they don't even do anything wrong because they walk in God's ways. God, you have ordered that your decrees should be kept most carefully. How I wish my ways were strong when it comes to keeping your ways. Then I wouldn't be ashamed when I examine all your commandments. I will give thanks to you with a heart that does right as I learn your righteous ways. I will keep your way. So please do not leave me alone. Lord, in your mercy, I pray that we as your children may seek you with everything that we have. That our obedience not just be about following rules, but our obedience be more about how we seek you, hear you, move through our faith and our trust, and give you all of ourselves. To bring ourselves before you and say, here I am, Lord, use me, send me. And wherever it is that you call me, I will go. I will go. For the seeds have been planted for the gospel and the name of Jesus Christ has been gifted and it lives within all of us. And through the power and the strength that comes in the name of Jesus Christ, may we be empowered, may we be strengthened, may we feel led and guided and where we stumble and where we fall and perhaps where we take wrong turns because we choose our way over yours and perhaps where we may mislead ourselves, maybe then through the power of the Holy Spirit that gently and softly and through compassion reminds us and tells us, simply just take a U-turn. Let's go this way. I will carry you where you cannot carry yourself. Lead us and guide us to be a people who are obedient as Jesus was obedient. That even in Christ's suffering, He was obedient even unto death. And not for His sake, but for us, for others, and for you. And so we may, may we in the same spirit be obedient in this way. So we praise you this day and we give you thanks. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. As we sing this final...